Okay, it is 7 o'clock, and we are ready to go live here with our webinar. So greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining us. This is um, our first webinar. My name is Michelle Lentz, and I'm the president of the Child Protection League. And this is uh, the beginning of a series of webinars that we plan to do over the course of the next year. And we're thrilled to have you join us. And, um, uh, and, and we're excited to be able to connect with you um, in, in this new platform. And so bear with us if we run into a little bit of glitches as this is our first run of it. But um, we have a, a, a spectacular presentation for you tonight. Um, called Transformational Education. Our presenter tonight will be Julie Quist, who is the chair of the board of direction, the board of directors of the Child Protection League. And you know, we are um, so proud to have Julie um, lead this group, and and you know, we acknowledge and appreciate the work that she does for the Child Protection League, um, and and the tremendous contribution that she is to. Um, to this organization. And so with that, um, Julie, I know you have your PowerPoint already loaded up there, and I'll just hand it over to you, okay? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, and uh, welcome everybody to the January 22nd webinar, Transformational Education. So um, let me just mention to you that Child Protection League works to protect children from indoctrination exploitation and violence. And we um, often work with issues having to do with education. That's just what we end up coming up against in a lot of, but we do much more work than that. But just for the sake of setting sort of a foundation of what are the kinds of things, why is it that we're encountering the kinds of things that we're encountering? That's why we're dealing with just the issue in this half hour presentation with um, transformational education. So I will start um, by just saying that what we're talking here about here is an organizing framework for, for, for today's education. It's um it's the basic assumptions. It's the ways of way of th ways of thinking, and you know some people call it a paradigm, and that 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 that, that is driving the educational system. And that's what we're talking about now. Obviously, this doesn't apply to every individual teacher or administrator. We're talking about a paradigm is driving the way education is functioning today and has for uh, you know, uh, several, quite some time. Here we have a picture of a guy named Edna O'Sullivan. He's director of the Transformation, Transformative Learning Center in Toronto. And so he's a good resource to tell us exactly what transformation is transformational learning is he says transform transformative learning involves experiencing a deep structural shift in the basic premises of thoughts feelings and actions it is a shift of consciousness that dramatically and permanently alters our way of being in the world this is the way they describe themselves he goes on to say such a shift involves our understanding of relations of power in interlocking structures of class, race, and gender. Now, note the next uh, point that he makes. As educators, we are not purveyors of knowledge. We are designers and participants in environments and processes. So a very major shift has happened in education, and that is that it is not primarily about tra uh, tr uh, transferring knowledge to the next generation. It is about changing who people are. So who is the father of transformational education? Well, it's Antonio Gramsci. Now you may not have heard of him, but he is the rage in education and people uh, know him who who've studied transformational education. And by the way, you'll find transformational education talked about all over in the education community. So it's, it's easy to find references to this. Gramsci was an Italian communist writing in the 30s. His idea, he, he was a Marxist, but he believed that it was culture, not economics, that is the center of revolution. And it's the group that controls social institutions that controls the rest of society. So political power is built on cultural power. And that was, you know, a shift from the initial Karl Marx thinking. 
became popular in the 70s in American universities, um, especially in dealing with education. There was a radical, he believed in a radical subversion of the, of, he believed that radical subversion of the culture creates revolution. So he is considered the father of multiculturalism, the culture wars. The idea was to infiltrate and subvert universities, churches, media, the arts. Uh, it, it is what is cultural Marxism is. Um, and so it is the institutions that that determine how people, what people believe and what their frame of reference is, what their values are. And that is what you have to change in order to have a revolution. So that's way from way back in the 70s. It took very strong root in the universities back there. He wrote an article called On Education. The primary strategy that he laid out for revolution creates social change by changing the way we think and speak. So an example of that would be, you know, in the schools, they're mandating the use of gender inclusive pronouns that transforms a child's concept of two sexes. So they, they require you to use the language that gives you the concept that you must adopt. It's, it's uh, you know, how you speak reflects and determines how you think. So, okay, so the strategies, some of the strategies he laid out for transformative learning, right from him, you will probably be familiar with a lot of them, if not all of them. One is to deconstruct the language. And here you have the idea that there is no truth or facts. Everything is a construct. It's a something that is developed by the powerful. So there's a construct that will protect their own power. And that is, it is uh, found in civics, math, science, history, geography, whatever field you will find them. Everything is, is a construct, you know, like the, uh, the idea of, of um, you know, our, our basic rights as individuals, for example, the rights that are laid out in the constitution of all men are created equal and are, uh, and are bestowed with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, um, endowed by their creator with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That isn't a truth. That's a construct. And it was put together by people, white males, to, uh, to control others. So one thing that I noticed when I, when I was active back you know, 15 years ago in, in education issues is that one of the central ideas that was being communicated by uh, the, the, the schools, the education system was that there is no truth. And it was very important that the child understands that everything is a construct and everybody has their perspective. There is nothing that's objectively true. And, um, you know, so you'll find it in, I mean, it has, it has become you know, what civics, even math, I don't know. There's a lot, we could do a whole session on constructivist math. Uh, it's the, it was the new math, it's not new anymore, uh, but it was, you know, white male math, <laughs> believe it or not. You know, and science, uh, everything is a construct. So you can see that even the idea that there's male and female isn't necessarily true. You may think it's true, it's your construct because you're defending your power structure but you know, science is built on facts, it's built on people's perspectives. So anyway, discovery learning, again, discover your own truth. But these are things that you'll find all over the education system. Discovery learning is a big thing. Teachers become guide on the side, not sage on the stage. Group learning to develop group consciousness. You know, that the idea that you don't individually perform, you perform as a group. Uh, very big in education. Everything is about power and group identity. So you don't have an individual identity. You belong to different groups. So it's a shift away from cognitive learning to transformation. All of that came right out of Gramsci. So deconstruction language, words mean whatever the left wants them to mean. Then you can see this is just a collage of some of them. 
gender identity, value diversity, social justice, white privilege, hate speech, critical literacy, Islamophobia, xenophobia, non-binary, you go on and on and on, they'll get new ones all the time, but there's no, the words become come to mean whatever they want them to mean, and they make up new concepts all the time, and you just shift from one to the other, so they're, you know, it's, that's the way they operate, they deconstruct the language, and so that, that, that requires uh, the um, the student, you know, to think that there is no uh, there is no solid reality out there. It's only what power groups create. This is deeply embedded in the programs and curriculum that are in the schools today, and so you, that explains some of what you 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 know you find coming out. And you see them as individual things, but they're actually all part of a a singular paradigm. Okay, what is the goal of transformational education? According to Gramsci, the goal is the total transformation of culture and society in order to create the worldwide Marxist state. Now, obviously all the teachers out there don't have necessarily a worldwide Marxist state in mind, but I'm uh, referring here to the paradigm that is created and people you know, uh, just feed into it. So they, they buy the, in, the, uh, the, the language themselves. And to a large degree, a lot of people don't fully understand what they're part of, but they do pick up on the concepts and they really push these concepts hard. Like for example, everything is a construct. I mean, they can really, they can really be a believer in that real strongly without realizing that this Thing, this idea was created and put into place, you know, by people who want to create an authoritarian uh, system. David Horowitz, his book, The Left in the Universities, David Horowitz was one time a leader in um, the left, and he was a strong believer in Antonio Gramsci. He was uh, He's a prolific writer. He was then, people looked up to him in the 60s. He was just a radical communist, basically. He admits that, a very radical activist in the New Left in the 60s. And then he he became um, enlightened uh, by some personal things that happened in his life. And he, uh, so he knows from the inside uh, about this because he was on the other side his quote here is, a grand, he, he refers to Gramsci quite a bit in his writing, and he's, a, like I said, he's a prolific writer. The Gramscian long march through the institution on the part of the 60s radicals began the redefinition of academic work from a search for truth according to professional norms to a political activism. That pretty well sums it up. I mean, that he is very uh, much knowledge, he's very knowledgeable about so here's an example, Champlain Park High School English Department. Now this is their graphic, the mission statement for their school English department. Look at those big words, social change, equity, social justice, student empowerment. Where is great literary works? Where is how to write and understand our culture and our heritage through, the, through great writers? Uh-uh. No, that's not even mentioned. So the mission statement is really, you can't read the small print there, um, but it refers to fostering equity, student empowerment, and social justice for the purpose of engendering social change. The English department is all about social change. That's what they say. That's their graphic. How successful have they been? Well, uh, uh, the third annual report on U.S. attitudes towards socialism, October 2018, millennials would prefer to live in a socialist or communist country. 52% of millennials would prefer to live in a socialist or communist country than a capitalist one. 26% of Americans have never been taught about communism in any education or professional setting. Half of Americans associate socialism with welfare states in Western Europe and Scandinavia, not Marxist dictatorships. So basically, people don't really know uh, what a Marxist dictatorship is. 
They don't know anything about it, but they support it. Here's another example. Zika sets the Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States, their spinoff of Planned Parenthood. That's their graphic, sex ed for social change. Okay, so, you know, they make people think, oh, we have to teach our, teach the kids about, you know, you know the parts of their body and, uh, you know, how to avoid STDs and blah, blah, blah. In fact, sex ed is for social change. So this is the quote from their fundraising letter, December 27th, 2018, less than a month ago. Moving into 2019, we recognize that we are far from ensuring that every young person receives the sex education they need, the kind that dismantles white supremacy and gender inequities and affirms identities and experiences that stretch beyond binaries and heteronormative expectations. So they're pushing a radical, cultural Marxist agenda in the name of sex education. This is a, <clears throat> this is a tweet um, that was January 16th is the date. I don't know if you can read that or not. I'll read it to you. It says, we need to prioritize educating young people about all of these concepts early on. Sex education is a golden opportunity to teach youth about dismantling systems of power and oppression that perpetuate white supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, and more. And they were responding to retweeting um, a comment from another organization that said, what is required to build power in spite of the forces of white supremacy and anti-blackness, patriarchy, racism, xenophobia, and others conspiring against people of color? Well, the answer Sikas gives is, comprehensive sex education. I want you to know that SICUS is highly influential with policymakers and educators. They have created national sexuality standards and national teacher preparation standards, and they are the largest promoter of comprehensive sex education in the country. And they are cultural Marxists. Okay, let's talk about this, this graphic. Let's talk about systemic racism using a historical lens to unpack white privilege. That um, is one of, the, one of the graphics that's out there in the system. I call it the race and social justice doctrine. Okay, and that's big. Um, it's a Marxist paradigm. Group identities to create shame or power. So if you're associated with a group that is, uh, you know, is shamed, like, a white male mega supporter, um, or if you are a person of color, it is to create your power. That's the whole idea. Everything is viewed through the prism of race. The idea of implicit bias, implicit means that all whites are racist, no questions asked, but the biases that people have are accessible through self-examination and self-criticism. I don't know if anybody rings a bell with anybody else, but you know, in the uh, Soviet Union and in China, they would have these self-criticism sessions where people had to, uh, you know, search themselves and, and, and confess that they had these biases for wealth and power or, or uh, you know, some, some kind of, of, of criticism that they were guilty of. So it's a, it's a form of, of real indoctrination. Um, they say mental constructs can be unlearned. So basically what they're doing is they're transforming our identities. They're shaming things, the traditional values and traditions, the history, the culture that we ident that make up our identity, our gender, whatever. Um, you know, they're transforming that, they're, they're, they're um, deconstructing that and constructing a new person. Only the powerful can be racist. You're probably well aware that, you know, uh, there are plenty of ways that, that uh, you know, Blacks or Hispanics or whatever can make statements that are very um, racist, but they aren't because they are the oppressed the same thing can't be said uh, by a white person or if it's about women, about, uh, you know, males. So 
It's very um, biased. Um, so you probably have, uh, you know, recognized that you can have a group that's called, um, you know, Black Power or um, Proud to be Hispanic or anything like that, but you may not, you absolutely may not say that you're proud to be white. That's not allowed. And that's a dangerous, dangerous thing if anybody says that they're proud of who they are. Every other uh, group can. So this brings me to, I just really have to bring this up because it's the thing in the news right now. But what's going on with this Nick Sand Sandman and the uh, Covington, Kentucky school and the, the march on DC and the MAGA hat and all that is just really a good example of that. This is a tweet from a woman named Ann Helen Peterson. And is, she actually works for BuzzFeed. And here she says, one theme of the conversations over the past 24 hours is how deeply familiar this look is. It's the look of white patriarchy. It's life in America. And so they put him next to Brett Kavanaugh, which of course they did the same thing to Brett Kavanaugh. But Brett Kavanaugh, you know, uh, was moving into a position of great power, which is on the Supreme Court. This Nick Sandman is a 14 year old kid, but he's Catholic. He's from Covington, Kentucky. He's pro life. He went to the March for Life and he had a mega hat on. And he is the enemy. I mean, he they want to destroy him and all those like him. And if you followed any of the things that they said, uh, that is the culture, uh, the cultural Marxist. They've identified the enemy and they want to destroy them. And that, I mean, it's a perfect example of what we're talking about, um, the paradigm of, you know, group identity. Here's the mayor of Covington, Kentucky, Joe Meyer. Our region is being challenged again to examine our core identities, values, and beliefs. See, I mean, they feel it. I mean, everything that we are, our core identities are being challenged and we have to examine who we are and come up with, uh, you know, confess that maybe we aren't what we need to be, or we can't be that, or whatever. You know, it's just it's it's amazing that the um, the group of blacks that were ridiculing and um, you know throwing insults and being uh, just you know to, to these these kids. Are never brought up as a, as I mean, and who's challenging the fact that they had the right to do the that to these fourteen year old kids, and that's what began the whole event is that they were being attacked by this group of of blacks and, and ridiculed and and uh, insulted. So now we're going into transformative education for educators. So teachers, you know, they have a tough time. They're also being um, transformed. A 2017 Minnesota law required cultural competency training for all licensed teachers, both public and non-public. So that law defines cultural competency this way, the ability to interact effectively with people of different cultures, native languages, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Well, you know, that sounds pretty benign. I mean, we all want that, right? Well, the Teacher Licensing Board, they're called the Minnesota Professional Educators Licensing and Standards Board, PELSB. They, when they put rules into, they were, you know, they were defining how do we put the law into effect? So they make rules. And so they redefined the meaning. Cultural competency training includes, but is not limited to all the following. Racial, cult, racial cultural, and socioeconomic groups. American Indian and Alaska Native groups, religion, systemic racism, that means all, uh, you know, all whites are racist, gender identity, including transgender students. So we have to assume that there is gender fluidity, that there isn't just two genders, sexual orientation, we must accept homosexuality, language diversity, 
and individuals with disabilities and mental health. Okay, so this is the graphic that is used to describe developing cultural competence. This is theirs, attitudes, knowledge, skills, and awareness going around and around. So that's that's what they're, they're, they're indoctrinating people into a whole different way of thinking about the traditional things that we believe and that we know. In other words, all licensed Minnesota teachers would have been required to be trained in cultural Marxism, white privilege, male privilege, whites are inherently racist, toxic masculinity, gender fluidity, embracing Islam, embracing LGBT and requiring gender pronouns. That's what it was about. So, and it is about also included in that, it says the training programs must be designed to increase teachers understanding of these topics and their ability to implement this knowledge with students, families, and the school community. Go out, you know, and pass this information on to the rest of the community, to parents, to families, to all those who uh, participate in the school and in the community. So the teachers are supposed to become indoctrinators themselves. Here's an example. In Islam Becomes Cultural Diversity, a Muslim student helped Sarah Pooley, 14, of Albuquerque, New Mexico, try on a hijab on the campus of the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque on February 1st, 2017, to take part in World Hijab Day. So that's the cultural diversity that we must uh, be, um, in, that must be inculcated into everybody's thinking. Overlooked by almost everyone, the teacher board rule also would have the Minnesota teacher licensing standards aligned with a set of national teacher licensing standards. It wasn't something that jumped out off a page because like, who knows what this is? Who knows what the interstate new teacher assessment and support consortium is? You know, it's a consortium that puts together national standards for teacher assessment. So what they did, this is the, this is the language in the rule that was being submitted uh, by the teacher licensing board, and that was consistent that that the the um, the training cultural competency training must be consistent with these in task standards. Well, you know, if you don't know what in task standards are and that little phrase, you know, you wouldn't notice too much about that. However, in task assessment and support consortium. This is their language, recognize the centrality of race and racism in the education system in an effort to redress inequities. Meaning racism is the central cause of the racial gap in achievement and discipline. Racism on the part of teachers, administrators. And um, that is, the, they say, recognize the centrality in the education system. Okay, so it's central. That's that's the that's what they want to put in effect as national teacher licensing standards. So INTAS creates model licensing standards for the country. They want all the states to adopt their model licensing standards. They want it, and that's of course exactly what was happening in um, Minnesota when the board um, submitted their rules. Is that they made it all consistent. They need to share strategies to change teacher policy and practice in all of the states, align in test teacher licensing system with state standards, which is exactly what they did. And it's all of this is tied to international standards, which I'm not going to go into. It's a whole nother thing. It's, this is an international effort. Not too surprising if you understand how the UN and Agenda 21 works. So I won't go into that now. Okay, in test model core teaching standards demonstrate awareness of the dominant and sometimes racist non inclusive ideology inherent in the education system and its effects on student motivation and learning in an effect to regress, redress inequities. I see I'm almost, I'm going to speed it up here because I'm running short. In task model teaching standards embrace and promote multiple perspectives and narratives. It sounds like Ramsey. In task standards are aligned with common core standards. So states are being quietly coerced into adopting these standards to improve professional practice. A lot of states have no idea that this is going on and it just sounds like all well, national teaching standards, sure. For most of 2018, 
CPL and other groups vigorously exposed the PL, PELSB cultural competency definition that overruled state lawmakers. They were basically redefining what the state, lawmaker, state lawmakers had done. Legislators, teachers, parents, and the public testified against it. Ultimately, it went to an administrative law judge who ruled that the, the PELSB could not align Minnesota's teaching licensing rules within TAS. I mean, that's a big deal. She said, no, you can't do that. That's not in the law that says that you will do that. So here is Education Minnesota, um, the, the union, uh, Denise Specht, Prince, uh, president. Uh, she writes in July 2018, you know, supporting the whole cultural competency training that they were trying to do. So here's, that's her picture. That's her. And I just took an excerpt out here real quick. I see people so defensive about their view of the world but they can't acknowledge uh, that they can't acknowledge the existence of fluid gender identities, unconscious bias, socioeconomic classes, and institutional racism. How else can you explain the horror-struck tone of the arch-conservative Child Protection League League's take on a proposed rule for training educators? And then she quotes us, which I didn't include here, which I thought was pretty good. Then she says the CPL is the same group that brought a fear-mongering full-page ad in the Star Tribune to dissuade the Minnesota State High School League from producing guidance for coaches of transgender athletes. Yes, we got some fame that way because we alerted the public to the fact that the Minnesota State High School League was going to bring uh, you know, transgender students into the locker rooms and the um, showers of their chosen gender. They didn't, people didn't know it before we took that out. So I thought it was pretty nice that we got the credit for all that. I, you know, appreciate that. Um, so the cultural competency definition does remain in uh, the law, in, to, in, in the rule that was accepted. However, the board removed its mandate to align Minnesota teaching teacher training with both the in-task standards and with its definition of cultural competency. So they got the definition in there, but the training doesn't have to be aligned to their definition. So when you think about the fact that all the private schools, the non-public schools, and a lot of the others, they, they need, they are required by law to have cultural competency training, but they're not required to do it this way, and that can make a big difference. But watchful legislators should look for the Walls administration to insert language into 2019 education funding bills, aligning teacher licensing within task and with the board definition of cultural competency. If Senate Republicans accept their language, it will become the force of law. Now, I, I'm up, my time is up. And I'm going to just do a couple little things about social emotional learning. And we have to really do a lot with that um, at, in a future time. Um, social emotional learning is the biggest thing going in education right now. And it is um, a huge data collection uh, thing. And I, um, it, it, uh, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's just one of the biggest things going. And, and so I'm just going to touch on it briefly because it is uh, transformational learning. Uh, it's, it's a strategy for transformational learning on steroids. Uses psychological personality tools to mold the desired character of their future global citizens to contribute to society. And this is, you know, we had someone, um, you know, go to the Minnesota SEL conference in uh, uh, 2017. And this is the way that um, the observer uh, described what was being presented. SEL instructors will train all teachers in mapping cultural values, which means identifying a student's personal cultural values and preferences in several categories. This information is collected in a data dashboard and measured to see whether an individual demonstrates changes in regard to attitudes, feelings, and behaviors. And the results are entered into a national SEL data bank. So they describe these five different um, elements of social emotional learning. You'll notice there's nothing in there about cognitive learning and they're vague categories that, you know, can be, you can put anything you want into them and they do. 
So a core curriculum is no longer about academic knowledge, it's transformational education on steroids. Okay, um, nationally and internationally, social emotional learning is an international effort. It is just huge going through some of the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the agreements, international agreements that our country has signed on to. It is a significant education policy priority and a key focus for education technology development and investment. Big data, the change from measuring knowledge and cognitive skills to collecting intimate data about social and emotional skills. It collects data on students' behavior and activities at home and school and can be used for targeted intervention. So now on the right here is their, um, this is their graphic. Culturally responsive teaching is transformative. Culturally responsive SEL, that's what they call it. And um, so, I mean, they, they're just out there a, a, a acknowledging what it is. So it's politicized outcomes, understanding implicit bias, teaching tolerance, cultural competence, and basically making social justice warriors. Over here on uh, where they're talking about, you know, here you have a, a, some students waging peace, you know, they've got a demonstration there culturally sensitive education empowers and transforms students. This is their language here. By helping them to develop the knowledge, skills, and values needed to become social critics who can effect, have effective personal, social, political, and economic action. I'm making social activists. And this is the last one that I have here before I get to the final graphic. Equity and SEL toward transformative social and emotional learning. So this uh, consortium called CASEL, that's the acronym they use, has put together a cultural analysis. And they're one. this is one of the quotes from them. Consistent with the pursuit of educational equity, we recently offered the concept of transformative SEL to reflect our interest in making explicit issues such as power, privilege, prejudice, discrimination, social justice, empowerment, and self-determination self in the field of SEL. So you're gonna to wanna to know more about that and we'll give that to you. And this is the graphic that I wanted to show you at the end. Minnesota Department of Children, Families and Learning in 2001, this is a baby cradled in the hands and it says their minds are in our hands. That's the way they see it. There I am, thank you.